happy Valentine's Day and welcome to episode 14 of 28 Days of Color presented by Steam Engine Academy. Today's topic, of course, color and love. We'll talk to a couple who've been together for decades and then we'll discuss the history of loving versus Virginia and how we came to have the right to marry outside or inside of our race. Stay tuned. Loving versus Virginia was a Supreme Court case that struck down state laws banning interracial marriage in the United States. Richard, a white construction worker, and Mildred, a woman of mixed African-American and Native American ancestry, were longtime friends who had fallen in love. They grew up in Central Point, a small town in Virginia that was more integrated than surrounding areas in the American South. Yet, it was the state of Virginia where they were making their home and starting a family that first jailed and banished them. In June 1958, they exchanged wedding vows in Washington, D.C., where interracial marriage was legal. Five weeks earlier, the longtime couple had learned Mildred was pregnant and decided to wed in defiance of the law. In order to evade Virginia's Racial Integrity Act, the pair had traveled to Washington, D.C. for the ceremony. Richard and Mildred relocated with their children to the inner city of Washington, D.C., but the family ultimately wanted to go back to Virginia. On July 11th, 1958, after returning to Virginia, the newlyweds Richard and Mildred Loving were asleep in bed when three armed police officers burst into their bedroom. The couple were hauled from their house and thrown into jail, where Mildred remained for several days, all for the crime of getting married. At that time, 24 states across the country had laws strictly prohibiting marriage between people of different races. After they were arrested and found guilty, the judge informed Mildred that, as long as you live, you will be known as a felon. The Loving case was a challenge to centuries of American laws banning miscegenation, any marriage or interbreeding among different races. Restrictions on miscegenation existed as early as the colonial era, and of the 50 U.S. states, all but nine had a law against the practice at some point in their history. Earlier attempts to dispute race-based marriage bans in court met with little success. One of the first and most noteworthy cases was 1883's Pace versus Alabama, in which the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that an Alabama anti-miscegenation law was constitutional because it punished black people and white people equally. In 1888, the High Court ruled that states had the authority to regulate marriage. In 1963, the Lovings approached American Civil Liberties Union to fight their case in court. After an extensive legal battle, the Supreme Court ruled that laws prohibiting interracial marriage were unconstitutional in June of 1967. Although such laws officially remained on the books in several states, the Lovings' landmark victory rendered them effectively unenforceable, ensuring nobody else would have to do endure the same treatment. The last law officially prohibiting interracial marriage was repealed in Alabama in 2000. Like many other milestones in civil rights legislation, the acceptance of interracial marriage has hardly been a smooth, celebrated, or overnight process. It was just 50 years ago it was illegal for blacks and whites to marry in 16 states because of anti-miscegenation laws. Mildred and Richard Loving, however, were not the only courageous interracial couple to make headlines that year. Just a few months after the Loving decision, Time Magazine featured, on its cover, the California wedding of Peggy Rusk, the daughter of then Secretary of State Dean Rusk, to Guy Smith, an African-American man. Jelani Cobb, a professor at Columbia Journalism School who writes about race, history, and politics, said, there are st still stereotypical ideas in existence. Attitudes have become more liberal about interracial marriage, but not universally and not to equal degrees. There's a scale of acceptability, Asians marrying whites, Hispanics marrying whites, and lastly, blacks marrying whites. The deep-seated beliefs that people have on race and pop culture, particularly television programming, are contemporary indicators of how societies feel about interracial couples. After loving, there have been efforts to mainstream black and white romantic relationships. Anyone of a certain age remembers the romantic comedy, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? where Sidney Poitier plays the black fiancé meeting his future white in-laws. But what's widely recognized as the first interracial kiss on television, airing in 1968 on Star Trek between Captain Kirk and Uhura, played by William Shatner and Nichelle Nichols, really tested society's tolerance levels. We've come a long way since the time of the Kirk kiss, said David Bushman, a television curator at the Paley Center for Media. 
They originally thought Spock should kiss her since he wasn't 100% human. Networks then were afraid of reactions from stations in the South and losing sponsors. Television, nevertheless, through the years, has helped normalize interracial couples. Shows like The Jeffersons and modern ones like Scandal and Grey's Anatomy, where romantic relationships between people of different races are ubiquitous, reflect America's changing demographics and tolerance levels. But resistance lingers, as evidenced by the 2016 presidential election cycle, where hardly any minority group escaped unscathed from discriminatory attacks. Considering how hyper-polarized opinions are now, it's reasonable to wonder if the increase in overt racism will have an impact on interracial marriage. Happy Valentine's Day and welcome back to Steam Engine Academy Presents 28 Days of Color. Today's topic, of course, color and love. And we're here with George and Eloise Bryce, married this year for 63 years. Hello, how are you? We're fine. Hello, George. Yeah, we're, okay. we all, both of us are doing good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. My first question for you is, how long have you been married? And when did you two meet? Um, we've been married, we'll be married 63 years this year. And George and I were in the same school from elementary school to high school. And, oh. and we met because we were going to the same school and did not really meet until we got to high school. Oh, wow. And, and George, are you the same age as Eloise or were you a grade higher or lower? Yeah, I'm older and she was, I'm a grade higher. <laughs> Very nice. And I hear, George, that you were an athlete when you got to high school. What sports were you in? Well, actually, it started uh, in uh, junior high. You know, I, I played football and I played uh, uh, baseball. And we also ran track. So I continued that when I got into high school. I, I, I joined the uh, B team and, uh, you know, played one year. And then I was uh, my sophomore year. I was going back to the B, B team, but then uh, the coach from the varsity came and got me and said uh, he was going to put me on, in the varsity squad. So that started my uh, career as a, in, high in, in high school. And, and Eloise, what are some things you did when you were in school? Uh, I, I didn't do a lot of things. Uh, I did took sewing, which turned out to be something that I continued right on into up to the day. Uh, played uh, volleyball. I like volleyball. Uh, I like baseball. And I even tried a little track. Oh, but right. uh, I didn't stay with that very long. I enjoyed being in some of the plays that the school had. And uh, I did a few of those things. But those were basically the things, the sport things that I like. Volleyball was one of my specialties. Oh, I remember my years in volleyball, too, coming home with those pink forearms from playing all day and yeah. serving. Yeah, oh. that's what you got. And so when did you guys realize that you loved each other, that you really cared about each other? Oh, this was uh, after high school. In high school. Well, we were you know, in high school, but it really didn't go until after high school. I was, uh, you know, I had a motorcycle. And I, you know, did quite a bit of riding on, on my motorcycle. And in fact, I, you know, I came by and picked her up and took her up to Yosemite for the day. And we got her back home, you know, late that, that afternoon. We pretended it was a teacher's day <laughs> at school. And so I did. And my aunt, who raised me, was forever saying, uh, nice girls do not straddle on the back of a motorcycle with a boy. So we always had to meet down at the corner when I was going to ride. And so uh, that was our beginning of being motorcycle riders. And I would like to mention that I cared for him before he cared for me. It took him a while to realize I was worthwhile. <laughs> and aren't we glad he did? Yes. And 
So what, what do you remember about your proposal when you guys decided to get married? Well, we kind of worked at it. It didn't start off really great. Yeah, she gave me my ring back. <laughs> I did give him his ring back once. We finally got engaged and then whatever happened, then she decided to give me my ring back. So I took it <laughs> and, and then we didn't see each other for a while. And then I came home one day and she was, she was at my house. And from there, we uh, kind of worked things out and uh, we finally decided to go ahead and get married. And there you go. And, and those ups and downs go with love. And it's really a triumph for both of you to have even been mature enough at that age to really work together to do something great. And you are the hierarchy of your family as a result. And so that brings me to the next question. What was your wedding like, your first wedding? I hear that you've had a couple renewal of vows. Yes, we've renewed our vows. Uh, first marriage. Uh, then we had our 20th, had our 25th, we renewed our vows, we renewed our vows when it was 50 years, and we renewed our vows, did we do it at 60 years? Uh, we didn't do it at 60 years, I don't think. Uh, and uh, we're just glad that we made it that far, because we started so young. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had made it so far, and my last year of high school. He moved me away from home up to Rio Vista because he was a trucker. Ah. And I came up uh, and that's where we started our really, our really marriage. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, after we moved out of Mercy. Yeah, actually, uh, we, we moved over to Pittsburgh. And once we got to Pittsburgh, that was, was when we really started, you know, things, you know, together. And then I had to teach her how to drive you know, because <laughs> when I had been a truck driver, sometimes, you know, you're, you're gone for a week or you'd be gone three or four days so to leave the car with her, you know, I, I would bring her over here to uh, a real distance and then uh, she'd take the car back, back to Pittsburgh, you know, just for her, her and, and Jack to get around here. Oh my goodness, that sounds exciting. Oh, so Tell me about your kids. I heard that you say your daughter. Tell me about your kids and grandkids or great grandkids. We have two daughters, Jackie, uh, Jackie uh, Span, Ba, and Patrice Span. Jackie had a set of twins that I love dearly, Lord and Elise. And uh, Patrice had just one. It's Tamaya. And uh, Lauren and Elise uh, are fraternal twins. And then Lauren, you turned around and gave us another set of twins. And uh, Kingston and Marley, who we love. Our first boy. Our first, uh, they're our only grandchildren, great grand. And uh, just you, you and Maya and Elise are our grandchildren. And when you guys were little, we had so much time with you that was really great when you come to stay with us we we enjoyed our time there as well grandma and while you're raising this family and then grandchildren and great-grandchildren tell me about the careers that you were both in as you grew up and you were raising families i'll let george tell you about his part of it first and george being married to george allowed me to go to college and so I went to college and got my degree. And then that's how, that's when I started to, in, a, in a nursery school, being a nursery school teacher. And my experience in that was always, there was always someone there to push me or help me. And I worked with children for 35 years until I retired. I started in Lafayette Arenda. Then I was in Walnut Creek. And then I was out in Bay Point, which is part of uh, Pittsburgh. And then I went to work at LMC College and ran the program there. And that's where I retired from. Ah, Los Mandanos College, right? Right, Los Mandanos in Pittsburgh. And you were a director at, at one point, I was, yes? I was the teacher for that program that uh -huh. dealt with 
uh, students who wanted to be teachers and parents. They were, they were allowed to be in the center three hours once a week wow. to show them a better way of dealing with their children who were two and a half to five, very young children. I loved my job and I loved the children. Some of them, believe it or not, after all these years, I'm still in contact with them, been to their wedding, been to the baby showers, that kind of thing. They kept, some of them have kept up with me. That's really cool. Uh, that's really special to hear, especially making that connection with your teacher. We do always like to hold on to those teachers that really started us off loving learning. And and Papa, what were you doing? What was in your, what field were you in? Well, as I started out, I was a truck driver. And mm -hmm. I drove truck in uh, Rio Vista. And then from uh, Rio Vista, I, I went to uh, Antioch. And there I drove truck for Chiquini Trucking. And I drove that up until uh, uh, we had to join the union, and Sakini didn't want to join the union, so he uh, uh, sold out all of his tractors. So then I decided to, uh, to well, I'll try something different. And you know, I, I put in applications uh, at, the, at the steel mill, uh, Dow Chemical, and uh, uh, what was it, uh, DuPont. And uh, anyway, I didn't get a call from DuPont. I wound up, you know, with a, a glass container in Antioch. And as it turned out, I was the first person of color to, to work at, at the glass container. Wow. And anyway, when I went there, uh, you know, they, of course, they started me out on, on, on the hardest job, which was <laughs> working back in the end, they called the hardy end. And, uh, uh, taking care of the, you know, uh, the we, we had six lines and it was divided. Uh, I had three and then the other guy had three. And so the main thing was to keep everything uh, in, in place. You know, anytime a bottle would uh, would fall down, then I would have to clear it. And then uh, when it went through, you know, take everything out. And then I decided, well, you know, I'll, I'll go back to truck drive. <laughs> So I came back to Rio Vista and I went and I drove truck for, for uh, DuPont. I mean, uh, Dow, uh, 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 MacDougal. And I drove for MacDougal uh, up until uh, 68. And then uh, MacDougal left California and went to Oregon, I mean, uh, Nevada. So I moved everything up, up there and then I took Eloise up and she didn't want to, she didn't want to live up there. So, too far. We, we, uh, we stayed you know, in Pittsburgh, and that's when I wound up going to a DuPont. And, and, and that's where I retired from, you know, pretty, in 28, almost 30, 30 years. But anyway, I was able to come out five, five years early. And so I've been retired for going on 25 years now. Ooh, 25. Oh, I'm looking forward to retirement already because you, you two have been on some amazing adventures. Tell me about the past time that you guys were in together traveling. Well, that was motorcycling. We have a motorcycle. Yeah, we have a, motor, a motorcycle. It's a, 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 a gold wing, the 1500 a gold wing. And uh, we, we, we have the CB. <laughs> Okay. So anyway, we started riding the motorcycle, so we would pick out a place to go. And uh, our first trip was was to uh, Yellowstone, and we we took off from uh, and, and rode to uh, to uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Yellowstone. Uh, yeah, we wound up in uh, uh, Yellowstone, so we uh, we uh, spent some time there, and then uh, from there we. Uh, we, we came back to uh, Mount Rushmore, and then from uh, Mount Rushmore, uh, we came and and, uh, and, and, and saw the, uh, uh, it's called, uh, uh, what's it, I can't think of the name of it now. Uh, uh, anyway, we saw Crazy Horse. You know, they, they build a statue of uh, Crazy Horse. So, you know, we, we'll you know so then we uh, left there and we came back. And then, uh, we took off again and, and, and went to British Columbia and uh, caught the ferry over, over to Victoria Island. And we, spent, and we spent about three or four days there and then we came back to uh, British Columbia and then we decided to head back home. 
And anyway, we are, of course, ran into a rainstorm. <laughs> it rained it was on horrible. us. It horrible. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we made it back to, uh, uh, what was it there? We came, we, we came uh, almost back to, to California. And we, uh, we we decided to to stay over, overnight. And uh, that's what you know we did. And then, then the next morning, we took off coming back to, uh, to California. We got into California. And we decided, well, we'll, we'll go to Reno. <laughs> so we uh, took off and we uh, went into to Reno, spent some time there, and then made our way back, you know, to uh, Pittsburgh. And uh, we stayed there for a while. And then the so next, trip, uh, yeah. yeah, the next trip was uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And, yeah, we went so to South we, Dakota. Uh, we went to South Dakota, and uh, spent, we we would go on. Uh, they were called the GWTA rallies. Yeah, every the every year they would yeah. have a rally in, in some state. So we, we, we've we been in about 13 states all told. Well, it was four. Uh, uh, we, uh, we've been in uh, Texas. Oh, uh, yeah. We were we've been in Texas. Texas. Grapevine, Texas. Uh, Albert, uh, what's that? Mexico? Where did we go? Uh, oh, wow. Uh, Mexico was. Uh, oh, Cassandra yeah. and, and uh, a yeah, friend of ours we hadn't seen in years. We went there, and I've been more places on a motorcycle yeah. than I ever have in a car. Yeah. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Albuquerque, New Mexico. Flagstaff, uh, Arizona. Flagstaff, Arizona. And I just stopped riding a couple of years ago. I figured it was time. And George still rides a little, but close, right close. And we're part of a group called Diablo Valley Wing, mm -hmm. and we ride together, six or eight of us, how, whoever wants to go, and uh, it's a good group. We go to lunch. Uh, we go to lunch, we still go to lunch together, all of us have age, and uh, we still go to lunch together, and and I miss riding a motorcycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really a nice way to see, uh, see the United States. It is. Yeah. In fact, I had to buy a little cargo oh, trailer yeah. so she could take her sewing equipment. <laughs> I took my sewing so equipment. So we just stay overnight at a hotel. She'd bring it out, you know, then she could sew. Then plus, you know, she could change clothes, you know, when we either stop, we would take off our motorcycle clothes and then put on our street clothes, you know, then we could go to dinner and places like that. And, and uh, you know, we had gone to uh, Four Corners. And uh, that's uh, Arizona, uh, uh, New Mexico, Colorado. Uh, what was it? Uh, that was one, one other state. I, I can't remember what it was. But anyway, it was called the Four Corners. And of course, you know, we uh, we had uh, gone, gone to uh, the, uh, the Grand Canyon. You know, we spent time in, in the Grand Canyon. Right, we did. And uh, you know, so, but like I can say we just would take off and then when we uh, got with the chapter then that's when, you know we would go on on out and uh, we had gone to, to montana we uh, had gone up into uh we went to cody cody wyoming and saw, saw all of the uh the buffalo bill you know they had they had a, a museum there yeah. so we, we got to see there you know and then uh, from from there we would work our way back and uh, we would go to a rally, a rally called Rally in the in the in, in the, the valley. valley, and uh, that would would take us o over to uh, uh, what is the, the town uh, Musky. Musky. We would go <laughs> in uh, Musky, and we would stay there, and then travel all, all around out in the, in the deserts, and uh, you know, and then work our way back. Well, we have lots of pictures of what you can ask. the road, and believe it or not, I learned to sleep on the motorcycle. And sometimes I'd wake up and cars would be going by and people would be <laughs> looking. They'd be looking to try to see if I really was asleep. <laughs> and if George came to a winding road, he would wake me up because you have to balance. You know, you have to kind of lean, yeah. lean into the ride. But I learned to sleep on it. Uh, and I take these little naps here and there. And uh, we rode in the rain. We had raincoats, rain boots, uh, all that kind of stuff that you needed. And you'd ride in the rain. And uh, sometimes you got trapped. 
because you weren't near a hotel and it would start to rain. So you'd have to ride till you could find a place. And the trucks were worse than anything, but they'd pass us and throw all that water on you. <laughs> and George couldn't see his through his visor. Uh, he'd have to stand up to look over the top. Yeah. And so when we found a place to stay, we'd pull over and we'd stay. And uh, all those years we rode, he never got a ticket. So we did really good. Uh, as I say, I miss it when the Harleys go by and the other motorcycles go by and you get that little pitter patter in your heart and remember how nice it was. And I had so much clothing to get rid of. Mm -hmm. uh, jackets, leather jackets, chaps, gloves. Uh, I finally got rid of all of mine. George still has his, but I knew I wasn't going to ride anymore. Yeah, yeah. We go into uh, Bay, Nevada, and we would go to Death Valley. And <laughs> we'd go down you know, through Death Valley and go, you know, they had quite, quite a few places where you could go and, and see what happened. You know, the 20 Mutine Borax Company was we in the Death Valley. And uh, there were, uh, you could go, so it was 68 feet below sea level, and uh, that at one time that was it was a big lake, and and uh, you know but uh, uh, it it uh, everything dried right out. Yeah. So it, but anyway, it it, it left a uh, 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 well, I forget what you call it. Uh, well, you uh, could walk out there. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you could walk and, and go. What I can't think of. Uh, and you, guys, you guys are involved in even more activities. I know, um, Grandma, you were mentioning sewing. What has that turned into over the years? What are you doing now with sewing? I still sew. And yeah. sometimes I participate in craft fairs, and I sell some of the things I make. In fact, I sent you, a, I'm going to send you a picture of a few of the quilts that I made. And... Uh, I've done them here. I've done them here where we live in Trilogy. I've done them in uh, over in Vallejo. They have one out in Vallejo. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I don't, I sell pillowcases and quilts and table runners, uh, those kinds of things. And I'm still sewing. In fact, I, have, I own three sewing machines, three sewing machines. That I've just kind of gradually, as they got better and better, I bought, you know, a little better sewing machine. And so I still do that. And that was my other hobby. George has his own hobby. Now, what are your hobbies, George? <laughs> well, I was a hunter. Ah. And I, you know, I hunted small games, uh, you know, ducks and geese, uh, you know, quail, uh, cottontails. And uh, I, uh, we used to go dove hunting every, every year because that was, uh, and then fish. Uh, you know, I did a, a lot of fishing. Uh, Sending you some fish pictures with his fish. You know, I've been up in, into Oregon fishing, and of course, I've been out into the ocean, uh, ocean fishing for salmon. Yeah. That, uh, would, uh, that's been my biggest adventure there, uh, you know, was uh, being able to. To fish in, into the Delta. We, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jim Summerlin, we've been all over the, the, the Delta, you know, uh, all, all the way to Stockton and uh, to Martinez and, and back up past Rio Vista, all, all up into the sloughs, you know, uh, black bass fishing. So that, you know, that was, was, was my hobby. And then at one time I used to bowl. I was a bowler. I bowl. <laughs> and we, uh, I, I bowled with two, two different teams. And uh, you know, Dupont had a team, and, and then we we had a what they called a scratch league. A bunch of bunch of us got together, and we we bowled that way. I, I've I've been to uh, four state tournaments, you know, where I've been uh, at, down to L.A., San Diego, and then they, when they had them up here, I, I was over in uh, 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 Napa, and then they they had one in Concord. Did you bowl a 300 one? No, I never bowled a 300. I, yeah, I, I, bowled I was just wondering, I'm trying to remember if you had. My, my highest was uh, to 258, and I did that down in uh, in Los Angeles. Back then, you know, they, they gave me a, a money clip. 
you know, that I got. I, I can't find it. He's a left-handed bowler, like Kingston is left-handed. <laughs> That's right, lefties. <laughs> and like Warren. And you and one of you are two uh, left-handed. That's yeah. right. And yeah. so tell me about making a home. When did you purchase your first home? We were just talking about that to your yeah. mom because our first home came because he got a, um, what did you get, a back pay? You know, I got a back pay from uh, when I was driving truck for TP. Uh, then they wound up having to having to join the union, the AFL-CIO union. We brought up and uh, it, in, anyway, so, uh, during that time, we, we got paid by the load. You know, you got a percentage, you got 25% of, of the load that you carry. And, but then we put in long hours. So uh, when, they, when they went to union, then they went back and said, okay, uh, this was so many hours that we did. Get we did. So in, anyway, they uh, wrote me out a check for, for $2,400. And, uh, and that was how we wound up buying a house you know, okay. in Pittsburgh. I'm sorry, $2,400 got you in a house? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, but the house, uh, we, we paid, uh, it was a, a nine fifty. That was a down payment. The house at that time was thirteen thirteen nine hundred. <laughs> and we, and we, we were paying uh, eighty. I think it was eighty seven or eighty eight dollars a month. A month. <laughs> <laughs> That's what houses cost you. The, the house in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yeah. The one on uh, on uh, ben, uh, Benjamin. Benjamin. That was our first house. Okay. And before that, we had lived in a duplex. Mm -hmm. And to pay the rent, we painted. We painted both duplexes. And we got free rent when we painted, a dupl painted the duplex. So it was nice to have a house of our own. It was a three bedroom, yeah. a three bedroom, uh, one bath. I think it was one bath. Yeah and had a little patio in the back uh, and a nice size yard. And that's where your mom and Patrice grew up. Yeah. Uh, and we were there for, God, how many years? We were there for, God, until Jackie was, till Patrice was in elementary school. Yeah, yeah. yeah and by then the house had, uh, had uh, asked, you know, access that we could get the money from the house mm -hmm. to get a bigger house. Yeah, and that's when we moved to uh, to Central. To Central, where you guys grew up. Yeah, so oh, we, that one's in Pittsburgh. Okay. Right, that one's in Pittsburgh, and mm -hmm. we bought that house, and it was a, I guess you'd say a three-bedroom house. Could have been a, a four. Level. It was a, a tri-level, and. Uh, that was the house we were in for 35 years. Mm -hmm. About 35 years before we moved to Trilogy and loved the old house. You guys loved the old house. Love the old house. Yeah, it had the trees <laughs> in the back, the figs, and the, uh, what else we had? Figs, oranges. Oranges in the back and, and so forth. And so it was a nice house. Uh, had we not, uh, moved out of still been there. It got to a point where the stairs got really important. Yeah, the three levels. It was like yeah, the living room and right. then the entertaining floor and then the bedrooms and then mom's like loft. Right. And it got where I, you know, I was careless and I was starting to fall down. Mm -hmm. And we decided to move closer to your mom and uh, your ex. That's how we wound up in Trilly. And we have missed them. Uh huh. In real business. Right. So you've come full circle. Yeah, we've been here for how many years? Fifteen years. Fifteen years. And uh, so, so far, so good. We're close to the kids, and they make their trips here yeah. and visit with us, or we talk on the phone. And I don't get to see enough of my grandchildren <laughs> and my great grandchildren, so they need to work on that a little bit more. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so you guys have been on this amazing journey together from the beginning when you were in school until now in your retirement. With all the experience you have, what is some advice you could give to some couples starting out? Don't give up. 
Work together. Work together. There are many times at our age that I, you know, you had to decide if you were going to stick because you were young. I don't advise anybody get married as young as we do. But uh, it, you know, there were times you just felt like, oh, I'm too young to do this. I can't do this. And then you have to stop and think about it. Like, do you want to live without this person in your life? And I find that you need to change together. Sometimes one person changes and the other one doesn't. And that makes problems. George and I basically uh, are the same. Uh, we like the same kind of things. Uh, we still talk and laugh about things and go back over the years and laugh at some of the silly things we did and the foolish things. Well, there were crossroads. You know, yeah, and, we and had crossroads. They called it, there was uh, valleys and, and mountains. You know, <laughs> so we would climb they up halfway and then we'd get up there and go, I mean, it, it's all just worth Is it. Is it worth it? Oh yeah, yeah, it's worth it. Then we <laughs> will go on. And then you start again. And basically, you shouldn't go to bed mad. I mean, it doesn't mean I haven't done it. But basically, no, don't go to bed mad. Don't try to talk it out. Yeah, don't try to keep it, you know, keep it. And think about how serious is it worth it? You know, is it worth it? And a lot of times you have to stop and think about that. And then when you get in as many years in as we have, what do you do? <laughs> what would you do if you did not stick it out for the rest of your life? Uh, I'm 82 years old. Can you imagine what you do at 82 years old and, and you're at that place in your life? And you're with the person you've been with all that time? you lasted this long? What? I mean, how hard is it to finish it out? Right. So right. I give George compliments. I couldn't have done it if it had been anyone else other than George. He's patient. He's kind. He's learned to accept me the way I am. Uh, he reminds me of things that I, you know, I don't always think about. Uh, he doesn't hold a grudge, usually. He doesn't hold a grudge. Uh, I'm not as good at it as he is, but it's not enough to shake the relationship or the marriage. So yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm where I where I should be, I guess. <laughs> is there anything else, George? Is there anything else you want to share with our viewers before we go? Oh uh, yeah, you know we've uh, been on uh, four cruises, and uh, we've cruised to the the Bahamas. Uh, we've, we've cruised uh, to Hawaii. Uh, we've been on. We, Started to the Mesa Riviera, and, and uh, we've uh, been to uh, Alaska. Back when we went to uh, Alaska, we we cruised. You know, we took the cruise first, and then uh, uh, after we got into Alaska, then we uh, we caught a train, and it took us to uh, Denali. Oh, that's right. We went by train. We, to uh, Niagara know, Falls. You know, rode the rode the train back. We got to see a, a lot of the, the country that was up there. Well, how is your marriage, Mr. Gray? <laughs> I said it softly. Did you hear me? How was the marriage? The well, marriage was, was good. You know, sometimes I, I had to hold her back. I mean, you know, <laughs> to be, be out there ready to fight the world. You can't do that. <laughs> you know, breathe. You know, take, take your time. You know, just go for a walk. <laughs> but I, all in all, you know, everything uh, worked out good. Uh, you know, I got to say, we, we had some good times, uh, you know, oh, the good, cruises good, were all good. Oh, and and uh, then we uh, we took a train trip to Niagara Falls, and uh, that was a, a nice trip. And yeah, then we took a day, bus yeah. trip from, from, from Trilogy, and we went, you know, down south and through the, uh, you know, the uh, Yosemite and what New happened. Orleans. And, uh, but uh, anyway, anyway, those parts of it, you know, we were still young enough to enjoy them and that was the main thing you know we yeah, as, as long yourself. as you can can get around and still do some of the things yeah. then uh, life is worth it yeah that's right i i've loved hearing this story and i'm excited for our viewers and 
your grandchildren and your great grandchildren to see this. And I think it's really special that we were able to really chronicle your love journey. And I appreciate you so much for doing this with me. Uh, okay. You're welcome, Nora. And I wouldn't do this for anybody but you. Well, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys, and I will see you soon. Okay. okay. I sent you pictures. So use the ones you think are worthwhile. Love you. Love you. Bye, baby. <laughs> Closing out episode 14, Color and Love, we're going to read The Princess and the Pea. This classic story is retold by Rachel Isadora, a Caldecott Honor winner in the African version. Enjoy. Happy Valentine's Day. The Princess and the Pea. Once upon a time, there was a prince. The prince wanted to marry a real princess. So he traveled all over the world in the hopes of finding such a lady. He met many princesses, but it was difficult to tell whether they were real ones. Iska, Waran, Salam, Jambo, Habari. There was something about each princess that was not quite right. So the prince came home again and was sad. One evening, there was a terrible storm. Suddenly, a knocking was heard at the gate and the old king went to open it. There was a princess standing at the gate, but good gracious, what a sight the rain and the wind had made her look, and yet she said she was a real princess. Ah, we shall soon find out if she is real, said the queen. So she went into the bedroom, where she laid a pea upon the bedstead. Then she took twenty mattresses and laid them on the pea, and then put twenty feather beds on top of the mattresses. On this, the princess had to lie all night. The next morning, the princess was asked how she slept. Oh, very badly, said the princess. I scarcely closed my eyes all night. Heaven only knows what was in the bed, but I was lying on something hard so that I am black and blue all over. That's horrible said the king. Now they knew that she was a real princess because she had felt the pea right through the 20 mattresses and the 20 feather beds. Nobody but a real princess could be as sensitive as that. So the prince took the princess for his wife. The pea was put in a museum where it may still be seen if no one has stolen it. There, that is a true story. The end. One more